Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. As you know, we talk about healthcare issues and everything from cardiac disease to diabetes to cancer, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, there's been a lot of communication to us about what I, I don't want to call it a disease, but it certainly is something which is, is harmful to our community and to our nation. Uh, and that's the issue of suicide. It's a difficult subject, but I would hope that you listen uh, because we have experts sitting right here on this set. I almost said stage, but we're not on a stage, we're on a set. Uh, right in front of me is uh, someone that you know well, is, uh, Dr. Gene Cash, otherwise Ralph E. Cash, Gene Cash, but it's Gene Cash to us. Uh, and he is a uh, Flor uh, Florida licensed psychologist uh, he's uh, a professor at a school of psychological studies at Nova Southeast University. Welcome, Gene. Good to Thank have you. Thank you. Good to Glad have to you be back. here. Good sir. And uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Caproni, uh, who is also a licensed psychologist and also an associate professor at the College of Psychology at NSU. Mm -hmm. uh, we're glad to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have you both. Well. As I said, suicide is a difficult subject to talk about, but let's talk because these folks out here have been asking questions. Uh, it's, it's wide open in the public. We, we see it, uh, and uh, we need to uh, talk about it. So, Dr. Cash, go right ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lipman. Um, suicide is the second leading cause of death population-wise in the United States uh, after accidents. Uh, it varies by age group, but across the population, it's the second leading cause of death. It's also the second leading cause of death among college students. And that, of course, is particularly relevant to us here at Nova Southeastern. It's especially personal to me because I lost two brothers who died by suicide. So it's been a passion of mine to try to do something about it. And it's in my opinion, very important that we make some progress with what I consider to be a public health crisis, and that's suicide. It's a crisis for a number of reasons, because of the, the loss of life and the uh, people who are affected by suicide. For every suicide, at least six people are placed more at risk because they knew the person or the people who died by suicide. And they are at much higher risk once they have a, a relative, a friend, or a close uh, confidant who dies by suicide. So that's of critical importance to me. Dr. Caproni, uh, let's mm -hmm. just you add your comments on this issue. Yeah, my, my first experience with suicide was as a very young child when a family friend had gotten a severe neck injury, was in a lot of pain, was taking pain medication, and uh, ended his life by suicide. So that was something that was quite difficult to understand as a child, and I guess it kind of stuck with me in some way. Uh, in my work with young people as a school psychologist and a clinical psychologist, uh, this is oftentimes uh, uh, an issue that we don't like to get into, but we have to, because as uh, Dr. Cash was saying, it is so common. And so when we train our students to be doctoral school psychologists, uh, this is one of the main things that we work on in terms of how do you interview, uh, how do you set up a relationship of trust with a young person, how do you listen so that you can kind of get the signs that they may be contemplating suicide. I read recently uh, from a very reliable source uh, uh, and uh, I, I'm talking about a medical source, a medical journal. Mm -hmm. And it, it was frightening to me to see the incredible number of suicides that occur between the ages of 9 and 18. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, I, I know that, that we, we strive mightily here at NSU to give support and, and uh, structural uh, value to everyone's matriculating lives as they're here as students. Mm -hmm. But 
it really struck me to know that when I read that, it said, I said to myself, 9 to 18? And the, the number of suicides are so dramatic relative to the rest of the what we call the, the century of, of age. Uh, it, it was almost frightening to me. Dr. Cash? It is, it's frightening to me too, and I think it should be to everyone. Uh, the youngest person about whom we know who died by suicide here in Broward County was six years old. And so it is not just an old person's disease or a middle-aged person's disorder or problem. It's a problem for children as well. And as our society places more stresses on children and as the what are called ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences accumulate, then one possibility in a failure of effective problem solving is to end one's life. And I'd like to emphasize that too, that suicide is in fact a failure of effective problem solving. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a last resort for people who often have very few methods for dealing with stress. And our society is increasingly stressful. So that's an important factor to keep in mind, I think. Dr. Caproni, I know that you, mm -hmm. uh, being so involved with mm -hmm. our student population, uh, again, I, I, I re-emphasize my comment. It was shocking to me to mm -hmm. see that age, you know, that 9 to 18 vector. Mm -hmm. it, it really was shocking to me. And I think that statistic goes to help us understand that this is something we have to take seriously at all ages, practically. Um, for many of us, our adolescence, for example, might have been a pretty good time. Well, it's not such a good time for all kids. And I think for adults, it's oftentimes hard for us to get our minds around the idea that a kid can have enough stressors, enough adverse events to push them to the thought of suicide. Now there are a couple of myths I'd like to address too. Sure. And one of those is that suicide is not preventable. It is absolutely preventable. And in the majority of cases, the person who is contemplating suicide has communicated this in either direct or indirect ways to people around them. So that's where I think we need to, again, I, I was delighted that you did this program because I think as a population, as a community, we need to become more aware of the need to listen carefully and to understand what these signs might be. Well, you know, the whole issue, and I, I think uh, Gene Cash, otherwise known as Dr. Cash, the last time that we were on this set, uh, we spoke about mental health directly right. uh, and the whole compendium of issues rel related to mental health. What element of some of those overlying things that I just mentioned are involved in the issue of someone dealing with, uh, I can't solve my problem and I'm going to commit or take my life? Well, the first thing, and the first thing that uh, is important to address in suicide prevention is the issue of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mental health is a, a critical issue in general, and a, a, a ment mental illness is a critical problem for our society, but uh, there are four evidence-based prevention methods for suicide. The first one is early detection of an intervention for mental health problems. 80 to 90 percent of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental disorder at the time of their death. And that's not a coincidence. The, the second thing, and by the way, mental health is costly, especially in this country. We have the highest costs for mental health services in the world, and therefore it's not easily accessible to lots of people, and it should be, it needs to be, that's preventive. Uh, the second thing that's a <clears throat> preventive measure, <clears throat> in addition to access to mental health services, is um, gatekeeper training. That is uh, enabling or teaching people in schools, in communities, and so forth, how to look for signs of suicide, the risk factors for suicide, and to whom to go when they are concerned that somebody might 
uh, take their own life. And then uh, it's very important to recognize that uh, re restriction of access to lethal means is a critical part of suicide prevention. Uh, we know, for example, that females attempt suicide much more often than males, but males complete suicide twice as often as females because they choose more lethal means. And so that's important. And finally, psychoeducation. That is, teaching people how to solve problems more effectively rather than to give in to the urge to try ending their problems by dying. Dr. Caproni, mm -hmm. what, uh, let's just add on to that because mm -hmm. I know how, again, I know how involved you are, particularly mm -hmm. in certain cohorts, uh, particularly the student population here mm -hmm. at, at Nova Southeastern. So why don't we talk about it? Right. I think uh, one of the big challenges to anybody, a, a young person or a parent or an adult, is what to do if you do start to get the feeling that a person you know or, cut or love is, is at danger, is, is at risk for suicide. So uh, one of the things I want to definitely put out on this show is that uh, 211 Broward is uh, available to all of us very quickly uh, and there is a suicide prevention component to that. There's a hotline within 211 Broward that anyone who feels they're at risk or feels that they need to get consultation about what to do for a person who is at risk can call that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, in, in, in sort of the, uh, the common communications thought, mm -hmm. if you got a problem, you dial 211. Mm -hmm. And if necessary, talk, or if necessary, yell. Yes. I need help. Yes. Right. right. Yes. I need help is the big is the big big group of words. Yeah. I need help. And that's not such an easy thing for a lot of us to say, because right. that cuts against the grain of many cultural and familial traditions. You know, does that mean I'm weak if I say I need help? It's the word shame. Mm -hmm. All right. So how do we get past that, Gene? Well, for one thing, it's really important to break the code of silence. There are lots of people who, uh, as Dr. Caproni said, uh, are contemplating suicide who, uh, almost always, in fact, they tell somebody that they're at risk or they tell somebody that they're contemplating suicide and they often ask that person, don't tell anyone else. Mm -hmm. That's a big mistake. Please tell. Please tell somebody who can help. Also, don't be afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say, well, if I ask a person if they're uh, thinking about killing themselves, it might put the idea into their head. Mm -hmm. That's not true. In fact, I've asked many, many people, maybe thousands over the course of my career, are you contemplating suicide? Do you think about killing yourself? And not once, not one single time in all of those uh, episodes of asking, did anybody ever say, wow, what a good idea, why didn't I think of that? Usually they either mm -hmm. say, no, why are you asking, or yes, how did you know, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Peter Caproni, what do you say to that? I want to piggyback on what he just said. Thank you. Because what I find, now I haven't been at this quite as long as Dr. Cash, but... <laughs> Nobody has. But in well, my... Dr. Cash and I are in a different... <laughs> we're, we're in a different age vector, but that's okay. <laughs> I have to repeat the same thing. I have never had anyone respond to my query about suicidal ideation with an attempt with suicide. It just doesn't happen. What I do often find is that sense of relief that a person realizes that they have now the ability to get some help, to share this secret, and to maybe find some other options that would, would work better for them. Well, you know, uh, again, just to reflect upon it, we, uh, we were talking the other day, just uh, a group of deans and myself, uh, we were having lunch. And we're talking about, you know, how we all grew up, you mm -hmm. know, someone in the Midwest, someone from California, someone from Pennsylvania, some from Brooklyn, New York, the heart of mankind where I was born, <laughs> uh, and, and others, and, and saying that, you know, we have multiplicity of families that are working more than one job, two mm -hmm. jobs. We have mothers and fathers sometimes working at different times. Does that lead to some... Uh, 
I, I don't know what it is, cause and effect. I mean, I, I'm not placing that harm upon the poor people that are, it's not poor. Some of them are, are middle, high middle class and middle class people who are trying to do well for the, for the children and their families. Mm -hmm. Is there some relationship to the fact that, the, that the, the family structure perhaps has changed over the last 20, 30 years? Well, certainly that's possible. Um, and family structures have often changed because now, in order to make ends meet, many times both parents, if there's an intact family, have to work. Um, the solution to that, I wish I knew, but I certainly think that that's a contributing factor. But one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that uh, while uh, the suicide rate has climbed dramatically in the last 18 years, since 2000, uh, about 30 percent in general for the population, about 75 uh, percent uh, among young women, uh, and those may be related to some of the stressors that you were talking about, it's important to keep in mind that the suicide rate in 1900, 118 years ago, was about the same as it is now. To me, that's appalling that we haven't done a better job of reducing the suicide rate. But that's been a problem for a long, long time. And so it's not just the immediate factors. All right, so we're back to what these folks have asked. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Dr. Caproni. What we can do as parents, as family members, is educate ourselves as to the warning signs that a person we love may be at risk for suicide. Are they showing signs of anxiety? Are they showing signs of depression? Do, do we have a family member who maybe isn't getting out of bed in the morning, is having trouble getting to work? All these different kind of things that may point the finger that they are not solving problems in their life effectively. Um, Harry Stack Sullivan, a famous psychiatrist, said that we should talk about problems in living as opposed to diagnoses. And I think that's where I like to start with people too. Uh, we need to ask questions. We need to listen to the answers so that the, fo that the person that may be at risk knows that there's somebody with them. The sense of connectedness, I think it goes back to the question that Gene was talking about, has changed over my lifetime. Uh, I grew up with my parents and my brother and my grandmother in the house. And I had other family members, an Italian-American family, uh, second generation. But those family members played huge roles you know, in our lives uh, in terms of helping to solve problems when maybe the solutions weren't within the, the house at that point in time. So those are the things that I think we don't have as much now. There is an aspect that I want to point out too, particularly with young people, that we often look at the internet as being a problem. You know, here, teach you how to commit suicide, that kind of thing. What we don't often look at is that internet connections can serve a protective function for kids who may not have someone in their family or their immediate friend group to talk about things. These, this is particularly relevant for kids who are LGBT, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, who are at very high risk for problems along this line. You know, um we're getting into that area again, but I, and I, if the word just got into my mind, because when you said LGBT, uh, there's a lot of bullying that goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, people relate to it as, you know, oh, they see it on television, somebody's being bullied on a school bus, or somebody's being bullied in middle school or whatever. But there's a lot of bullying that goes on beyond that. Mm -hmm. Can we discuss that a bit, Gene? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, bullying is related to suicide. Uh, I don't mean to imply that bullying always causes suicide or that we have enough evidence to indicate that bullying specifically is the cause of suicide. But there's a high correlation among young people, school-aged people, but also people in the workplace uh, uh, between being bullied and later dying by suicide or attempting to die by suicide. And our bullying prevention programs in many cases are not very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the programs that work in other countries 
don't seem to work in our schools here, for example. And part of the reason is because we have such a heterogeneous population. The bullying mm -hmm. prevention programs that work best work best in schools that are very homogeneous in terms of culture. And so we have to be creative in how we respond to bullying. But the bottom line is that we have lots of bullies, not only among the children in schools, but also among school personnel. And that's really sad. Very often people learn to be bullies in their homes. I'm convinced that it's related in part, at least, to domestic violence. And when uh, a child sees his or her parents fighting with each other, bullying with each other, or bullying each other, or, or one parent physically harming or, or psychologically uh, bullying the other parent, then two things can happen in that child. Either that child will be, have tendency to become a victim himself or herself, or will have a tendency to become a bully. Mm -hmm. If we could get rid of domestic violence in this country, I think we could solve 50% at least of our problems in schools and our problems in society in general. From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> really, Dr. Caproni, it is, uh, I don't mean to make light of what we're talking about, because mm -hmm. I really believe that uh, we, we, we're trying to answer questions and people want to know what we right. can do. You mentioned 2 on one which is important. Yeah. But I, I always tell the people at the end of the show, and you'll hear me, please talk to your physicians. Don't mm -hmm. communicate. Absolutely. Communicate. Because you are, you are the, the masters of your own health. Mm -hmm. What you're saying, what I'm hearing you saying, I believe, is that they've got to be able to communicate. Just because someone is sleeping in the, in the morning and they're not getting out of bed, they may not recognize it as depression. Mm -hmm. They may recognize it as the fact, oh, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, they worked so hard, they worked eight hour shift, 10 hour mm -hmm. shift, they worked in six days a week, whatever, they just, they're tired, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for okay. sure. Okay, so for let's sure. talk about it a bit. For sure. I actually do want to come back to the idea of the bullying issue, particularly yeah. what I would like for our listeners to think about, whether they're parents or family members or maybe school personnel, uh, teachers, guidance counselors, administrators. I'd like you to think about it from the kid's perspective, a middle school kid or a high school kid who's experiencing bullying, for example. What goes through their mind in terms of their readiness to share that information with a responsible adult. When kids come to me, they often tell me things like, I'm really concerned that this is gonna make things worse. You know, I don't know how the school is going to handle it. I don't know how my family is going to handle this. And this, I think, applies to both the suicide potential as well as the bullying situation. So we have to kind of think about, uh, we have to empathize with the young person's position as to the, the pros and cons of coming forward and sharing with us. And we have to make sure, I think, that our doors are open in that regard so that they have a sense of trust, that we're gonna handle it responsibly, that we're not gonna overreact, that we're not gonna underreact, but we're gonna to listen to them. Well, I always say open doors lead to open minds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would hope that the people that are watching this program and ask the questions about suicide, what do I do? Obviously, they have to communicate, they have to reach out, yeah. all right? Whether it's an, uh, what they believe is an impersonal thing, it's just a call, like calling 911, someone is having trouble breathing, they, whatever, they call 911. If someone believes that something is happening, they gotta call 211, correct? Yes. And uh, certainly, they should reach out. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we're doing here at Nova Southeastern in our medical schools and our healthcare programs is we're adding significant cohorts of information relative to mental health. We're down to the last couple of minutes of the show. Uh, Gene, uh, again, what can we do? I think that uh, the communication is key and it's so important in my view for everybody to get used to uh, asking someone about whom they have any concerns at all, have you been thinking about harming yourself or killing yourself? And if the answer is yes or maybe, then say, let's get some help. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's get some help. 
-hmm. And Dr. Peter Caproni? I want to address the population the undergraduates and sometimes graduate students too in university settings. There are resources available there that you not, they may not be aware of in terms of college counseling centers. In many colleges now are ramping up their availability and accessibility to mental health services for their students. So don't assume that you're in this on your own, that there may well be very quickly and very close by help for you. Well, as you probably know, uh, we at Nova Southeastern University have contractual services with uh, counseling agencies and counseling services. Right. And of course, we rely heavily upon the wonderful minds of people like yourselves because we do listen to hear what you have to say. So we are in constant modification and in what I hope to be improvement in the availability of mental health services, otherwise known as counseling services, otherwise known as health services. There are a lot of different words that they use at different colleges and universities, but we're, we're here. We're very student-centric, as you well know, mm -hmm. so uh, we want people to understand that we're very sensitized to it, mm -hmm. and it's because of people like yourself and advocacy and knowledge and the capacity of what you have brought to not only the School of Psycholog Psychological Studies, but in your writings and your presentations. And we thank you both very much. I always said, I've, I've said this before, and, and Dr. Cash has heard me say this, advocates are the blessed people of the earth. <laughs> so uh, with your knowledge, if you uh, continue to advocate to prevent suicide, to help people to get information to you, to others, you've done your job. So thank you very much, Dr. Peter Caproni. We appreciate your work. And what can I say? Old friend, Dr. Gene Cash. I wouldn't say old. Long time. <laughs> uh, how about long time friend? How about thank that? You. Long time friend, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Gene Cash. Uh, we thank you both for your work at uh, the uh, Nova Southeastern University uh, College of Psychological Studies. Uh, we're very proud of our school. Uh, we're very proud of this university and, and the fact that we do uh, bring these issues to our students. And thank you very much for being here. Folks, I, I hope that we gave you some answers to some of your queries, some of your questions. Remember, again, uh, it's, it's, it's important. I always tell you to take good care of yourself. But I, you have to extend yourself. Sometimes you have to take a little good care of other people that are around you, that have faith in you that believe in you, and uh, maybe if something comes up, help them, help them get to people that can help not only themselves, but yourself as well. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, remember, this is your show. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. Uh, there's a telephone number and an email address right here. Uh, if you have any questions, just send them on. And if you have any other subject matters you want to know about, just let us know. Remember, I, once again, I keep on telling you, this is your show. My name is Fred Lippman. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. Until next time, see you.